Um, a very good evening to everyone watching. On behalf of the Indian Conclave, I would like to extend a warm welcome to everyone present here. The annual uh, national level entrance test for law schools, the Common Law Entrance Test CLAT and the All India Law Entrance Test ALIT has just been concluded. And as aspirants are eagerly waiting for the counseling process to begin and get allotments into law colleges across the country. So choosing a discipline such as law is certainly not an easy one. And I know this for a fact, having written CLAT just last week. So joining me on this esteemed panel to, in an attempt to educate and clarify any questions law aspirants might have, is joining me is advocate Nam Naman Vankadari. He's an alum of the University Law College, Bengaluru, and currently a student at the Jindal Law School. Uh, he's a passion, he has a passion for advocacy, and that is complemented by his multifaceted personality and dedication towards achieving his goals. Sir, it's our honor to have you here. Joining us also is Mr. Shreyank Nandivada, presently a student at the National Academy of Legal Studies and Re Research, Nalsar, which is ranked as one of the best national universities in the country. Shreyank is an incredibly talented individual uh, with a knack for debating and model UN competitions, complemented by his generally accepted sense of humor. And I am Uri Prashant, your moderator for the evening. And like the rest of you, I'm looking forward to an engrossing and a valuable conversation. So I would like to revert the floor first to Mr. Shreyank, um, Shreyank Nandivada. So after say, you uh, wrote CLAT last year and you sec secured a really good score and being a student in NALSA, which is one of uh, and the acclaimed national universities in the country, how has your student experience being in a law school been and how is it going so far? Uh, first, I would like to thank the Indian Conclave for giving me this opportunity to reach out to fellow aspirants because I definitely would have appreciated something like this when I was writing CLAT. Secondly, thank you, Urvi, for the question and moderating this uh, debate. So my experience as a whole being part of NALSAR has been something great because it's not something that you've learned at school. It's a completely different this thing. So generally at school, you've had teachers who have handheld you. They've told you this is what you have to study. That's what you have to improve on. But when you come to college, it's like you're dropped in this big sea without a life protector and you just have to figure out your own way. But while I say that, I've found different people who've helped me figure out my own way, figure out what my journey in law school should be, how I should navigate through law school. And these people have been seniors. So one of the key experiences I've taken away after a year and a, after my first year and my second, third semester in, on campus is that seniors are always approachable. Now, I'm not saying this is just restricted to NLUs, but the kind of culture and the environment that we have here, it's most, mostly senior oriented. Because at NALSA, we have something called uh, tutor programs, wherein the seniors actually come down and they teach you the specified courses. So I had fifth years who were teaching me criminal law, contracts, law, of family. And in that sense, it became easier for me to ask questions because you always have that thing that what if it's a stupid doubt and I can't ask the professor? What if everybody laughs at me in class? So in this kind of a more friendly situation, it's like a candid conversation you're having with a senior who's teaching you a course, you can just approach them, ask them a question. Now, that's been sort of scratching the surface of my experience at Nalsar, but not to take up more of my time, I would obviously like to hear Naman sir's uh, this thing. Um, sure, that was lovely how you put it across and, you know, it just makes me also to just want to get my allotment and get into an, a law school as soon as possible. So I'd like to revert the floor to Naman sir now. So tell us about your law school experience and how it's been in the legal circuit since you, you've been part of it for some time now, even in your professional capacity. Thank you, Urvi, for that question and Shay for such a lovely introductory remark. Uh, well, uh, to begin with, I am an accidental lawyer, as well as a law student to begin with, because uh, I have told this on multiple occasions, but law was never something that I envisioned, like though it was somewhere in my mind when I was in my 10th grade and 11th, that is my first PO, etc. But owing to certain peer pressure and distractions, I had uh, convinced myself that 
other hobbies that I was very active in, like drama, theater, etc. This is where I belong. My interest area is history, geography, political science. Uh, so I will pursue a career which complements uh, these subject areas and my hobbies. But uh, try us with destiny that you know I ended up uh, becoming a law student. Firstly, uh, as my law school experience, long story short, uh, I was a student of University Law College, Bangalore University, currently doing my master's in OP Jindal. Uh, I would uh, want to uh, ignore the OP Jindal master's part because it's online course and in one month I'm done. But speaking, considering two of y'all are very young, one is a student of Nalsar and you are an aspiring lawyer yourself and a law student would be. Uh, my uh, initially to begin with my first semester was quite turbulent because I was not uh, coming to terms with reality uh, because I was I my hobbies were something else my areas of interest was something else and you know when law subject was something I was not accepting the entire environment uh, the entire atmosphere I was in front Christ Junior College and then sudden transition to Bangalore University uh, Christ caters to students from one section of the society or even though there is a lot of diversity it still caters to one class while bangalore university you have people from all walks of life so to get uh, used to that uh, hetero heterogeneous atmosphere was quite challenging but uh, then coming to my law school uh, journey i think it is the best thing that has ever happened to me today if i have to sit in this position and answer this question because firstly bangalore university university law college gave me that freedom uh, to explore, to experiment, to interact, to network, and to grow. To, the, to which the maximum credit goes to uh, my faculty members of University Law College. Uh, because they uh, never, because though we had attendance and we believed and classroom education was an integral part of it, uh, we were also the atmosphere kind of pushed us to not just restrict ourselves to classrooms, but, you know, in turn, interact with senior advocates, interact with uh, other lawyers, go out and participate in competitions, go out and travel uh, and uh, participate in conferences, make new friends, uh, explore. You know, it was not something like which was mandated by the university, but for anybody who was passionate in growing, this place never stopped you. Even to this day, this is very much the practice over there. If you are that individual who represents the college, if you are that individual who stands out and, you know, uh, gives uh, gives yourself to a certain exposure that where you can holistically grow if you are that individual who can you know achieve and bring laurels uh, to the institution uh, even to this day i believe that a lot of students get that push which is not the scene in most of the counterpart law colleges because attendance classrooms assignments uh, these are the things which is of course important but i also believe that Today, uh, it, is, it is going over the roof and it is kind of badgering the youth energy. So that way, my law school uh, was less of classrooms, uh, more of networking, uh, less of classroom education, more into library education, less of uh, classrooms, more of experiential learning, be it participating in MUNs, be it presenting papers in counterpart departments, or be it uh, traveling uh, across the country, across the globe and representing the institution. So my uh, five years law school was all about experiential learning, where experience played a predominant role than just uh, classroom uh, education and the institution supported us a lot. And these credentials kind of also helped us in, you know, honing the leadership skills. So we, we had an, a very dynamic uh, NSS club, uh, NSS unit of, of the Bangalore University. We have a very predominant uh, moot court society, which is one of the oldest in India. We are currently 28 years old. We have a very efficient, the model United Nations Society, which has just started off and, you know, doing a lot of good work for the institution. So even the, because of this exposure that we got from outside and which the institution helped us, I think these uh, these extracurricular activities is truly helping us shape our uh, leadership skills. And considering that law school, especially in Bangalore University, is a very predominant department, you have a lot of exposures and you know have a lot of opportunities to grow as an individual, not just restricted to college and uh, scholastic activities, but also as an individual, you can be, it can be political, it can be legal, it can be social, it can be economical. You know, law school uh, is the, this, my law school gave me that foundation for growth. That was so inspiring to hear, in fact, and um, that actually will lead me to my next question to, this is a question that I'm opening to both of you. So uh, 
one of you is just a like a bud in the legal field just starting to blossom just getting a taste of you know what the legal field means and one of you is slightly established and knows how the practicing and the intricacies of the field work so i want to hear from both of you why in your opinion should one choose law like what should be the right motivation for someone to choose law and what are the expected challenges that come with it with being in the legal field and being a law student so you can go first all right sir uh, thank you so much so uh, why somebody should choose law is a difficult question for me to answer because everybody has their own journey towards selecting a certain field whether it be law whether it be commerce whether it be anything everybody has their own specific set of reasoning and why they pick that field now for me why i got into law and what drew me towards that field was that one i did a lot of mu1s i used to debate a lot and all of us have that pre-existing uh, sort of uh pre-existing image of a lawyer that they're always sitting arguing they're always researching so that that was sort of my first the first this thing that because i i really like research so that sort of led me into the law field also i was able i also had the honor of doing a try a, a mock trial a mock trial before i could join law school so that just boosted my confidence into going into law and doing law for sure now why somebody should select the field of law that's difficult for me to convince them because they have to come to that realization themselves but one thing i will tell you is if you do select the legal field there's nothing that restricts you because once you do come into the legal field that teaches you some of the basics which will work in any field so from law you can jump you can jump into public policy you can jump into litigation you can jump into becoming a diplomat you can write your upsc you can write the judiciary you can become a judge so it never restricts your opportunities per se it actually opens your eyes up to a much wider world which exists out there now the second is uh, i'm sorry i didn't catch the second part of your question if you could just repeat. um so the second part which you could answer is what are the challenges of being a law student see uh, the challenges are number one from shifting from a school environment immediately after your 12th grade to a law school it's sort of difficult that transition because then you have a lot of work you don't have anybody who's hand holding you you don't have professors who are always there and who always have their door open because professors also are also doing their own research now don't get me wrong i'm not saying professors don't like it when they are when, when you approach them it's sort of different from a school to a college setting if you do get what i mean now the other challenge is research now if you haven't been habituated to research it's something that's brand new to you because the second you search something say i want to search a uh, certain judicial cases i open manu patra which is a search engine i type a certain thing say arbitration i will get a million results to say the least now understanding how to narrow that down is sort of a acquired skill which you learn as you go through law school as you do your internships another problem is another problem that i have faced is that law school learning to internship learning is completely different law school it teaches you the basic fundamentals so they'll give you a ipc textbook they'll tell you this is what goes into it say murder you have xyz ingredients if these ingredients are met you're liable for murder but when you do go to an internship you actually learn how lawyers craft that meaning into their into how they can win the case so say a murder meaning says an or and an off a lawyer a skilled lawyer will pick up that or and off and say this it doesn't apply in this case so an internship is completely different because it becomes a little difficult to apply that the physical learning and the applied learning in this scenario so those are certain issues but none of these are so major that you can't overcome through your five years and through a little assistance from your professors from your teachers from your seniors and also from the internships that you do so internships solve what law school can't is my mantra after what i've done after two internships so that's what uh, i have envisioned and what i've seen through law school after my three semesters right that was certainly you know uh, an eye opener um so naman sir if you could take up 
we could take up your views on the same question yes certainly i will urvi but before that now since you are our uh, you just finished an exam you wrote clat previously now you are also applying in other law schools which comes out of the uh, nls uh, bracket so what is motivating you to take up law so understanding young minds like yourself i think i'll have a better perspective to answer this question um i don't think i might be the best uh, person to ask this question to if i'm being extremely candid i think i um she was law mostly out of like uh, an option of elimination mm -hmm. uh, that's where i kind of came there i i'm i'm not i i it will be false to say that i have like some natural drawing towards the legal field or something like that because a i don't know i have no idea how the field actually works what i've seen is sitcoms like suits and all of that which obviously cast a very fake sense of how the real field works right so initially i'd say a very illusioned sense of what the legal field was drew me and um and then after that like studying the subject like extremely rudimentary things of the subject just piqued my interest as to it as a subject matter it was interesting it was engrossing it piqued my curiosity and nothing at least nothing very um viable or something i could have prospects in a career piqued my interest like the legal field so by a choice of elimination i arrived at that So at least you are better than me because you had something that drew you towards legal profession. I'm like me, where I just randomly dropped myself in the loss. <laughs> and I think both of us have something in common that is art, where you are a dancer while I had theater to my uh, back. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> but as I said, some inclination, but here zero inclination. Well, uh, now coming to career uh, in law and answering and taking it forward from where uh, my friend Shay just left. Uh, so. there was a time you know like if you just go to the millennial era of the 20th century or the early 21st century probably uh, either of you were not born at that time you know like i'm 1997 so i think you were all post 2000s uh, so in that time you know like when we were growing up you know when we were seeing our cousins etc right, medicine and engineering was the thing you know like it always all it was always medicine or engineer medicine or engineer now suddenly the dynamics have changed you know now it's like law has taken up that hegemony so i still remember in my from my childhood that is like my uh, kindergarten days to now uh, medicine and engineering played a predominant role and then when i was in high school i saw that along with medicine along with engineering chartered accountancy had gained some steam and then now i see that you know somewhere in the middle of my law school especially in my third year or fourth year i had a lot of relatives giving me calls and like uh, you know in kannada they used to say nan maga law maadbekadre my child wants to do law so please give him some guidance he is now you know draw, drawing inspiration to do law he wants to you know get into that law ambit so over the years law started gaining momentum now even if you take the statistics of how many people appear for clat exam you see that year by year year by year now today clat stands in that position after upsc examinations especially the csat ones uh, today you see that clat is the second most uh, significant examination in this country which almost is parallel to neat examination uh, before you know when i used to be in school uh, all of my classmates most of them used to go to the cet coaching classes but then over the time i have some youngsters at home you know now when they are going more than cet i see people going to clat coaching classes uh, so they've taken uh, a small edge over it so over the period of time now i see that law has taken that scope now the next question is okay now why do you want to do law so just like how i asked you i asked uh, now uh, i have interacted with a lot of people why you want to do law once again no answer you know like especially recently you know especially as most of your counterparts have written the exam or people like few months ago after that johnny depp and Who's an Amber Heard's case? Everybody's like, "Oh, law, law, law." In fact, I saw Instagram stories also. The world's most awaited judgment is here. After all, two Bollywood Hollywood actors, you know, their family dispute, their internal matter, they have gone to the court, and the entire world has gone gaga about it. But just exactly two, three days ago, you had the U.S. Supreme Court striking down the uh, Roe v.ersus Wade judgment, which has put the entire women rights movement backward, which has cancelled the fundamental rights of women. And you see how many people are tweeting about it, talking about it. but minute it was a hollywood actor and a hollywood actress husband and wife a family dispute nobody wants to talk about triple talaq cases where you know because of which 
a lot of uh, family disputes are happening. Nobody wants to talk about certain conservative practices within the family, which is keeping the woman backward. Nobody wants to talk about polygamy and child marriage, which is still an issue in the country. But to Hollywood actors, you see how it's creating a gaga. And people are falling to these false narratives and joining law. Now, coming to career opportunities, you know, like keeping it a little less political and more uh, into the subject. Now, the uh, subject matter uh, as to what and uh, the career opportunities in law. So once again, once you join law school, any law school for that matter, you will encounter three kinds of students. One, drawn towards the corporate field. Because corporate field works in some cases works very similar to that of how the IT field works or some in-house counsels, wherein you will be a legal counsel for a set company or you'll be doing a lot of corporate desk work for them. So you need not necessarily appear in the courts, but uh, earn your bread and butter through giving suggestions and uh, helping them draft agreements, non-confidentiality agreements, NDAs and contracts, etc. Just giving them solutions, legal solutions, and helping them legally sort their case, like drafting the MOAs, articles of association. Second kind of people that you uh, usually encounter are the ones, you know, who already have, you know, who are tier two, tier three lawyers. And the tier two, tier three lawyers are first generation, second generation lawyers. Like, you know, like their fathers, grandfathers are already, uh, they already, they're already in the legal profession. They have a very established firm or they have good connections in the society, which can, you know, give them a very uh, possible and a very bright uh, legal career, like politicians, children, or uh, kids uh, who have an established uh, law family or whose relatives are good to do in the profession, et cetera, et cetera. Third are those people. Again, the third category is subdivided into two. One, the clueless batch, like uh, you know, who have aspirations in UPSC, government services, diplomacy, career in the UN, career in the government, et cetera, et cetera. Like now today, especially the military, JAG exams are also gaining a lot of stuff. So in law, so what I would suggest if you have to take as a suggestion is and now I have a lot of people that come to me like, sir, uh, I want to do corporate law. I have a vision to do corporate law. I want to do that. I want to practice. I usually tell them, boss, calm down. You have five years. I know it's good to have goals, you know, but I as an individual do not believe in goals. I believe in a vision because goals at times, once you achieve goals and especially Shrey will be uh, able to resonate it well because I have a lot of these national law school uh, pass outs, CLAT pass outs who like during, during the 11th and 12th they say that my goal is to get into national law school, my goal is to get into any of the NLUs across the country but once they achieve that goal they be like oh it's not worth it and so many people drop out or so many people get demotivated, so many people commit suicide. I have seen these cases, I have experienced these cases so I, I know this at the first time. So what I would suggest is do not have goals as in have a vision that, you know, I, I want to make this much money. I want to become this established. I want to, you know, build a career, have a vision, visualize that goals at times, if you have it and if you're chasing good for you, uh, because I personally do not believe in goals. I repeat myself. I believe in having a vision, uh, have, if you have a goal, good for you, but do not jump into conclusions. Do not, do not jump into career options. What I would suggest is you have five years time, that is 10 semesters. National law schools especially believe in tri-semester concept and some uh, private law schools also do follow that. Suit. So give yourself to five years, give yourself to multiple internships, give yourself to multiple exposures, maybe uh, intern in an NGO, maybe intern in a government office, intern in a ministry, intern in a corporate firm, intern in a law firm, intern under a judge, intern under a minister, intern in the UN, intern in any of the plan statutory bodies like the plan, Niti Aayog or uh, law commissions, etc. Experience, explore, understand. Because first year, so you're like, oh, I am getting into corporate law. Then once you go there, you know, you may be getting a good pay and your dream position, but maybe, you know, there may be that regret. Okay, maybe I, may, I should have tried advocacy or maybe I should have tried my hand in the civil services or maybe I should have pursued a career in the UN. Because yes, corporate law is giving me good pay, but career opportunities in terms of growth, I see my friends doing better in litigation. So do not put yourself in the place of regret. So firstly, to begin with, one step at a time, have an idea research and understand how every single fraternity works understand how corporate law works understand how litigation works understand how government services work understand how local self government works understand how the un works so have that world view have that nationalistic view have that global exposure if not try to experiment yourself and persuade yourself in such a way that you know where you get that kind of an exposure 
where you get that kind of a network. And then when you, by the time you're in third or fourth year, you get that understanding that yes, this field has so much scope. This field can may help me get good money. This field can help me become politically powerful. This field as a pro or as a professor can help me stay connected with the youth. So because as Shrey was telling, law gives you multiple opportunities. It not necessarily you have to wear a black coat and go argue in the courts. Not necessarily you have to wear a blazer and go sit in an AC room and work in a corporate office. Not necessarily you have to wear formals and go teach. You know, you have a career in public policy. You have a career in the UN, United Nations. You can ask uh, many law aspirants appear for UPSC. Most of them do really well because every year you see the top 10 rankers, at least three to four of them are from uh, law school backgrounds. So, and I think when recently when the UPSC results were out last month, uh, All India for fourth or fifth was an NLS graduate. <clears throat> so you have, uh, you have a lot of career opportunities within a law school. So what I would suggest is, you know, give your five years to experience, explore, rather than remaining stubborn about a career choice, which I find in most of the youth. They say, oh, sir, corporate gives me good money. No, that's why I do law. I go to corporate. Bullshit. No. Experience, explore, understand, network, meet, connect, and then grow. And I think this is how you can potentially not just, you know, expand your horizons, but also expand your spectrum, but also grow as an individual and have a great career for yourself. Uh, that's definitely extremely insightful. And I think everyone should really, you know, have something to take away, whether they're, they're already in law school or planning to go there. That was extremely insightful for all of us. So that, um, okay, I'm changing the mood a little bit here. That will probably lead me to my next line of questions. So Shrey, this one's for you. So, uh, you know, as Naman sir said, CLAT as an exam is gaining so much prominence. I mean, say like 10 years ago, CLAT was probably just an exam with probably maybe like six, 7,000 takers. And this year we had around 65,000 people are across the country writing the exam. So more the people, more the prominence and more the competition. And uh, there's also a lot of, you know, um, emphasis given to taking drop years in CLAT. So as someone who has cleared CLAT in the first attempt, what is your uh, you know, take on uh, a drop year for CLAT? Do you think it's necessary or is it advisable for students? See, when I was writing CLAT, my parents had made it very clear. If you get in, you either get into the top two NLUs or take a drop year and rewrite CLAT. So they were very obvious with that. So CLAT was my only choice of exam. And I had only written CLAT when I, when I was writing my entrance exams. Now, not everybody should have this sort of a mindset. That was because of different re various personal reasons also why I've written CLAT and why I only aimed for that. Now, taking a drop year is something that is not necessary because NLUs are not end all, see all. It's not like if you don't get into an NLU, you're not going to crack it in the law field or you're not going to have the same opportunities that a non-NLU graduate does. Now, I will accept that when you do get into an NLU, it does give you, it does sort of put your foot in the door to certain opportunities, which being from a non-NLU might not. Now, a drop year, I think everybody should sort of think about it twice because you're wasting a year of your life. I'm not, not wasting rather, but you're putting your, you're, you're putting your, this thing, you're putting your life on hold for a year and then write, rewriting and rewriting an exam. Now, one thing that CLAT has done good is that 2023 CLAT is taking place in December. So there's not that much of a turnaround period. So if you've written it in say, we're, we're in June right now. So that's in a, till December, that's a short period of time. So you're not going for a whole year of preparation. Because for me, I could, I could never prepare just CLAT. Even in the last month, I did struggle a little bit when it was just CLAT preparation. Because when you're in school, you sort of have that mindset. You have to study, study, study because your board exams are coming closer. So you have that additional motivation. Now, if people are really hell-bent on getting into an NLU, please take a drop year and uh, rewrite CLAT. But... Again, as I said in the beginning, NLUs are not the end all and see all. You have various opportunities available at different law schools, which are wonderful, who have wonderful faculty, who have wonderful opportunities to provide to, provide to you. Uh, I've seen a lot of my batchmates who have taken a drop year after going to say Symbiosis Pune or DSNLU, Vishakapatnam, which is one of the NLUs, uh, which is one of the relatively newer NLUs. 
they did that because they had that uh, whole idea and that aura surrounding nalsar that they wanted to get in nalsar or nls so if that's something that you want to do a drop year is something that you should definitely take because a drop year will give you something addition uh, an additional this thing because you have 24 hours a day to prepare for clack so it becomes easier because you've already written the paper you've analyzed the paper you've seen where you've made the mistakes you can improve on those areas and go ahead so a drop year if you really if you really think an nlu is worth it then a drop year is something that you should consider but in my opinion i don't feel like a drop year is worth taking because i also had that idea where i should take a drop year but i didn't want to right that's definitely helpful information um so naman sir uh, that will lead me to another uh, a new tangent of the same line of questioning so let me like tell you a little bit as to how i feel about this so um when i told my parents uh, i was going to do law it was quite a surprise because uh, i'm kind of the first person in my family to even take humanities up so when i said law of course the first projection or to someone who has no idea what the legal field means is that it's an nlu or nothing and my parents were also in that very a uh, same aura for almost one and a half year so uh, the last six months of clat when you start learning more about legal education that's when my parents really started opening up and they started seeing that there's so much more than nlu as legal education and you know uh, they stopped putting emphasis on oh only top one nlu or top two nlu <laughs> okay and that also really helped me with my preparation so as someone who hasn't studied in an nlu and has an established career in the legal field so uh, this after the establishment of so many almost like 18 national law universities now there's all, there's like this tremendous emphasis given into getting into particular like there's so much hype into one college so in your honest and candid opinion do, do non nlu students really have like a bleak future in terms of opportunities which are accessible for legal in the legal field like that is you know per the popular perception so once again so <clears throat> law as a career did not originate after the nlu came into existence let's get that fact very clear uh second of all shrey was talking about the requirement for a break year break year is absolutely a luxury and a privilege i'm very sorry and i may sound very insensitive to those who have taken it up but it is true uh, for a lot of people a lot of people are aspiring to come up in life or fighting poverty or who are here for survival you know it is a luxury that most of the people can't even dare to dream because in some years if especially you take women and you know if minute you talk about break year it means that they may never ever come back to education again you know it may be they may be married off or they may be put into labor and god knows what may be the other consequences so once again i wouldn't because shrey has very laboriously answered it now let me just uh, talk about nlus or nothing initially when nlu started you know there was nothing called as clat especially when the national law school uh, came uh, into existence under the leadership of uh, great uh, professors like madhava menon sir or vb kutino sir when they envisioned the concept of national law schools uh, back in the late 1990s you had nothing called as clat you know it was based on your 12 standard second pu merit if you made the cut you made and then other colleges started replicating the model and it has become quite a thing now and then later as uh, time grew you had these private coaching classes uh, uh, where in you know they promoted a law uh, as something legal education as something that you get into a law school you make the cut and you don't get into a law school you know like your life is almost good for nothing so in that marketing strategy i think somewhere the students were made prey because there are so many law schools uh, like university law college which is almost like a, a more than a 50 years old bms law college which is more than like all these are bangalore restricted by the way which is like a more than which has a history of more than 50 years glc mumbai you know which has people which has hosted people like ambedkar and ramjet malani bangalore university university law college which has produced three chief ministers of karnataka and more than 10 uh, judges who have gone on to become chief justice of supreme court like justice mn venkata chalaya etc so <clears throat> what i intend to say is national law school i'll tell you where national law school uh, or the preparation of these nlus come into a uh, picture is number one students start working really hard from a young age you know that seriousness that importance that significance and that magnitude 
of a law student or a lawyer once you graduate out of a law school that preparation and that pressure you know like once you become a lawyer the pressure that you are expected to handle the responsibility that you are expected to handle the knowledge and the intellect that you are expected to maintain and uh, inculcate that it puts you in that process of that preparation because kids of 15 16 17 years of age are you know giving into like 10 hours and 12 hours of studies to just crack the single examination and once they get into the national law school they certainly have a pedagogy they certainly have an environment that you know prepares them for such responsible roles prepares them to take up that pressure prepares them to you know have that uh, intellectuality so that is where national law schools or law students or law aspirants who try to get into national law schools that is where they have a small edge but otherwise to work hard you don't need to be a national law school student to go to the court and sit down you don't need to be a national law school student to intern under an advocate you don't need to be a national law school student to take up a book to read about our country's history to read about our constitution to understand jurisprudence to understand international relations to understand property law family law criminal law ipc ipc and evidence does not discriminate between an nls and a national law school for the matter of fact if you notice the symbol of lady justice she is blind she can only hear so what does she listen to she listens to wisdom she listens to truth she listens to intellectuality she listens to areas who caters to justice so your ideas your uh, vision your hard work has got nothing to do with law school you are a law student it comes with serious responsibility because today i see a lot of these law students who are namesake lawyers but have their field in multiple other careers career is still good but i would rather go to a radical step of saying they're distracted okay even if you are a namesake lawyer and you know you are flourishing in other careers absolutely fine but some of them are in the name of the law school tag they are doing irrelevant things they are dropping out they are you know just wasting their time it it's really uh, blood boiling you know some of them just become law students but don't show up that responsibility but that is not a possibility in national law school you know you are expected to stay grounded you are expected to stay dedicated and you are expected to devote yourself so it has a mechanism in place to you know guide you through those principles but in a in other law schools you have a system of course system is there everywhere but it is more of an individualistic decision you know because when you are studying professional ethics i was taught about that in my final year you study about seven lamps of advocacy when you know these are the seven things that you need to do as a lawyer you need to be wise you need to be witty you need to be dedicated you need to be uh, <clears throat> very uh, religious to your profession you have a lot of uh, criteria you know so these are you know the quintessential requirement of a law student is discipline you need to have discipline you need to be dedicated towards your subjects you need to have uh, interest towards your subjects as shrey was telling couple of minutes ago you know in ipc you may just study what is mens rea in evidence that tends crpc put together you may only study what what are the ingredients that you know qualifies as a crime what are the ingredients that can qualify as a murder you know what are the ingredients that qualifies as a rape but how do you cross examine how do you say that yes this is a rape how do you say no this is not a rape how do you say that no this person has not committed a murder you know these are the things that you learn out of experience so law is less of subjects less of uh, classroom learning more of outside world learning more of outside the four wall learning you know you have to observe you know you just can't hear you have to listen you just can't see you have to observe you just can't read you have to understand you have to conceptualize so that is about law field you need to be hard working you have to be industrious you have to be dedicated you have to know current affairs you need to know uh, you need to know about the constitution you need to know about the basic facets of what constructs a, a society you need to be able to sympathize with the people you need to understand their sentiments you need to understand the psychology because these are the aspects that plays an important role when you're cross examining or representing yourself in a notorious case so these things you know not necessary that one learns through national law schools these are human instincts that you know you need to put yourself to uh, and you know you need to learn Uh, as an individual not just through the means of schooling or an education system but as an individual to grow as an individual to prosper and as an individual to come up in life so in law school or no law school as long as you know you have good company of friends you have a habit of reading about uh, reading the newspaper reading good books writing articles speaking about them being vocal about it representing the people filing rtis for helping an advocate uh, draft writ petitions 
going to the courts, understanding how the court works, having friends within the corporate sector, understanding how a corporate law firm works, trying to establish network with the government officials, understanding how bureaucracy and uh, legislative business happens, having that entire uh, uh, worldview of how the profession works. I think these are the things that you can do as a student. And these are the things that you can do as an individual. The, you have to inculcate that curiosity. The fire has to kindle within you to learn. The fire has to kindle within you to have a encyclopedic approach towards everything that's happening across life. Because law is one subject where you need to know something out of everything, if not everything out of something. So if you have that kind of an approach, if you have that kind of uh, uh, an attitude to learn, to understand, and to represent, I think uh, national law schools really don't matter. It's just the preparation uh, and the seriousness that truly matters. But otherwise, you don't need an institution to tell you what you need to do, what you need not do. Freedom fighters of this country's majority of them, 80 out of 100 people are law graduates or lawyers themselves. Even a person who was responsible for the partition of this country was a lawyer himself. The viceroys who came and represented India for, as for, on behalf of the British government, the British Queen, were uh, law graduates. So law is everywhere. Law is universal. Law is like the middle row in a Venn diagram, the one which takes the center part in a Venn diagram. So law is a universal subject. Dharma Shastras, you know, the entire world evolved with the concept of law. And law does not need a textbook approach to say that, oh, this is good, this is bad. You have an idea, you have an opinion, you want to change something. You can start introducing a law by yourself. You can start advocating for a belief yourself. You can start saying that this system is wrong. Let us have uh, a, this particular system because times are changing. That's entirely how even the Constitution of India came into place because we had certain practices which were, uh, you know, inhuman. But the then framers of the constitution said, no, this practice is wrong. So let us come up with something new. You had a constitution in place. So that way, law is innovative. Law is something that adapts to time. Law is something that changes to time. So for that, you don't need an institution to tell you what you need to do, what you need not do. You need to have an idea. You need to have that focusing. You need to have that rigor and you need to have the passion. So if you have these things, dedication, discipline, dignity, and decency towards the subjects, I think you will do wonders and one institution or a couple of 80, the like 18 institutions uh, is not a quintessential requirement to tell you what you need to do, what you need not do. If you can reform within, if you have an idea, you have a vision, you can do wonders all by yourself. Because today I see so many people who are not even law graduates, but yet argue better than lawyers. I think you have a very famous case also. <clears throat> Akshay Kumar had done that into a movie. Rustum. So... He was not a lawyer, but yet he won the case in the uh, court of Bombay. So that way, law is just an understanding of certain things that already exist in the society. That's where the entire concept of jurisprudence comes into play, where you need general knowledge to apply, uh, where you need logic to understand certain scenarios and adapt it to real-time scenario, as simple as that. So for that, it is within you to make the change. It, uh, in an institution really does not make a difference. Even it can be NLS or it can be Harvard or Oxford uh, or any of these Ivy League universities. Maybe that is just, a, maybe those certificates may have true value and they may have a certain system to discipline you, but you don't need someone to discipline you, correct? The entire fundamental uh, purpose of human existence is to change, reform and build. And that's how we as a civilization progress. We did not have anyone to dictate terms to us. So if you can bring in the reformation within yourself, you don't need any XYZ authorities to tell you what you need to do, what you need not to. So that is my uh, case with NLUs and non-NLU students. Law schools really do not matter. If you have the che you have the capacity and strength within you, you can do wonders. That's that's very true. Um, just you know, a, a something to you know just not challenge but you know ask you another uh, question i think i'll open this to both of you shriyank as well um because you know shriyank is a student of an nlu and a um, popular you know uh, justification for the hype that nlus create is the uh, you know exposure and the opportunities that uh, nlus get you know beat in moot courts they get they participate in the best moot courts in the world they get uh, you know, they get to compete with the best legal minds 
around the world, which may not be a, a possibility for all law schools. And since what you spoke about an individual's discipline and individual's capacity to make it, but how much does an institution facilitating such uh, you know, um, platforms for its students make a difference. And Shreya, this I think Naval sir can answer. Shreya, what I can expect from you to answer is that, do you find any like stark difference in, in your peers who are non-NLU students and the, and the opportunities and the way that you are taught in, you know, the streamline of education in an NLU? Do you find any difference in that? So either one of you can take up the question or, you know, answer in any way that you find pertinent to this. Um, Naman sir could go ahead with the... So yes, you know, like when it comes to moot courts and the pedagogics, see, once again, I want to answer it in two ways. One, of course, moot courts and these uh, trial courts, model United Nations form a very integral part of your legal uh, education and giving yourself to these simulations, not just... Uh, you know, uh, churn your uh, mindset and uh, thinking capacity, but also gives you multiple opportunities like networking, growth and socializing and maintain building those connections, which helps you in your career. Later. But second of all, the entire law school experience or your career or your life as a whole is not revolving around uh, these competitions or these opportunities. Because I can show you people, if you come with me to the High Court of Karnataka, I can show you my seniors, my classmates, my juniors who have failed in subjects but they're doing brilliantly as advocates who have failed in subjects who have become judges of the high court who have passed with backlogs, but you know, they have defeated me in the cases, you know, they've defeated so many toppers uh, in the education. They have got great remarks from the chief justices uh, or the judges of the high court, Supreme court, etc. So of course, and these are the people for let alone practicing, uh, sorry, participating in moot courts, MUNs, etc. But these are the people who have, you know, like failed. These are the people who have never attended classes regularly. These are the people who have, you know, like barely shown any interest to uh, legal education. So that is one thing. Now, second of all, now the coming about now restricting myself to the opportunities available just in the law school. Okay, uh, let us say now because of the uh, expansion of technology and the opportunities, you have some websites, you know, which does not discriminate you between law school and a non-law school student. Of course, the preparation, the amount of pampering, the amount of opportunities given to, let us say, students of national law school representing their institution in a moot court like Philip Jessup, maybe academically within the uh, system, there may be more reforms in the institution to, you know, say that, okay, these people are representing the college. So let us not take attendance for them. Let them work on this uh, moot court meticulously but that may not be the scene with many of their other counterpart law colleges or the non-law schools but once again you have uh, speaking about opportunities alone today you have pages like loctopus bar and bench and other uh, websites where you know you have a regular update of everything that is happening that is relevant to law students so if you have a habit of checking uh, them up regularly and you know like you check the college mails regularly and uh, you know you are just in that a circuit of you know where you under where you get to know through your friends i don't think you're deprived of opportunities no second of all now let us say because i myself when i was in second year i defeated national law school in an international law school law moot court competition which was uh, the commonwealth uh, nations moot court competition south asian bonds we defeated the national law school and on multiple occasions in my muns i have had delegates who have come from national law schools uh, we have i have the credential of uh, defeating them i don't want to make it very ii over here but I come from a college where, you know, it has predominantly these Kannada medium students. Of course, English medium, though, is the medium of instruction. As I told you, the diversity, and I'm very proud of it. You know, like most of our interaction happens in Kannada. Most of our activities happen in Kannada, the courtroom. Are, and today it's helping me overwhelmingly because in lower courts, not necessarily we speak in English. It's Kannada that dictates the laws. It's judgments come in Kannada. When we go to rural uh, parts of Karnataka and present a case, the majority of the dictation happens in Kannada. So... Back then, even if, you know, people have judges who oh, Canada medium log hair and kind of things, but today in the profession, that is helping us humongously. And I don't think this kind of an exposure is available in the national law schools. Well, people from national law schools who have come and who are uh, looking forward for a career in advocacy here, they're taking in a lot of efforts to learn and understand read Canada, though they are domiciles of Karnataka, though they've done all that basic education over here, today to read and articulate in Canada has become a big thing for them. So, and I see a lot of them in my office too, you know, who are struggling to read with these articles, the FIR copies that comes from the police station, or when they have to go to the police station, get a bail or amicably settle a matter out of the court where police is usually involved. I see them getting neatly cheated by the cops because they don't know to articulate in basic Canada. 
or even sometimes they get caught by the cops for drunken driving and you know like they don't know how to bail themselves out and it's the kannada medium boys who go to their rescue now coming back to the opportunities and where it comes you know like once again it's all about hard work of course the where i give credit to the law school is the, the national law schools is the kind of pampering in the atmosphere they get when it comes to preparing themselves for these competitions preparing them into these uh, uh, events but otherwise uh, it's all about because you know once you're a student and you have the required knowledge and required skill set i think national law school or non national law school really doesn't matter you know if you have the talent you can overpower them you can certainly defeat them and i can tell this to you out of personal experience uh, so that way yes of course you know when you go to a competition when there's a delegation from national law school it is certainly something where you know your heads turn and you know they create that kind of an intimacy but if you know how to you know hold the bull by its horns and fight the bull by holding its horns i think it is really uh, it really doesn't matter because it's all about confidence capacity and uh, capabilities so that way though shrey will be take answering this question about difference between national law school students and the non national law school students uh, now of course because you people have studied for these exams and you know you have passed and you have gotten to a meritorious law school you know like you you carry that pride on your sleeves and you walk around but once you're in the court of law it's as simple as this they call okay case number 3527 appear it's either i'm appearing for petitioners my lord or respondents my lord there it doesn't matter if you're from harvard or whether you're from national law school whether you have sat under a tree and passed law and correspondence it's once in the eyes of law all are equal so that is where uh, i would want to rest my argument so i think picking up from where aman sir left off uh i don't find a very stark difference between nlu students and non nlu students because uh, i think one thing that helped from the covid pandemic was the whole technology boom that happened now that everybody has access to technology uh, they have the same, they have similar opportunities that we do because there are so many free resource websites where you can get textbooks you can get uh, different types of books uh books about constitution which used to cost maybe 5 6000 offline but now you have copies online which you get for free so what a call what an nlu could boast saying that we have this whole constitutional volume set instead of picking up a hard copy you can just go online to certain websites such as z library and you'll find the exact same volumes there for free so i feel like there isn't much of a difference but one thing that i can argue as an nlu student is that an nlu provides you with that kind of an environment where you're always under that learning banner so even if you're having a normal conversation with somebody uh, at some point it evolves into a conversation about your academics or your uh, your a conversation about internships now i'm not saying this doesn't exist in uh, other law schools but this is just from my own personal experience wherein i've been able to approach seniors ask them i want said internship they give me contacts they say you can contact so and so person they'll give you the internship you can use my name as a reference so in that sense internships uh, have been re- very resourceful to me for being from an nlu and again i know this is like this is uh, uh something that your parents have always told you if you have a degree from a good college anybody will accept you so that only what they don't tell you is the rest of it that it only gets you in the door but what you do after you get in the door is completely different because once you start working it doesn't matter whether you're an alsar graduate you're an nls graduate you're from simbas spune or you're from any xyz college as long as you're working hard your 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 degree doesn't matter anymore it's only what application you're doing for that now when it comes to moot court when it uh, at nalsa we have a very robust moot court committee we have an adia committee so yes again that gives us a lot of access which i'm not entirely sure other law schools do offer because <clears throat> right now itself from being in a second year what a lot of law schools offer international moots only to fourth and fifth years me being a second year i'm able to apply for certain international moots and go for them now these moots would be reserved for fourth and fifth years but there's nothing as such at nalsar wherein they restrict you so the glass ceiling indirectly is broken by the institution itself they don't say that because you're a second year you have to do only a national moot or you have to do a simple moot wherein you don't get confused so if i haven't studied a single topic on constitutional law but tomorrow if i want to do a constitutional law moot say it's the number one ranked moot in the whole country 
if i if i go and beat my seniors in an open challenge they'll give it to me so there's no restriction on learning and there's no restriction that you can do only xyz things because of the year you're restricted in now this is what my experience from nalsar has been but obviously certain other law colleges also have this i'm not saying that this is only an nlu thing this is only an nlu thing wherein they say you can do this you can do that every single law school will offer you opportunities as long as you're willing to take it the second you think you have an opportunity and you feel as navan sir said as long as you have a vision and you feel like this is something i can do this is something that interests me and that individuality that you have comes out there's nothing that's out of your grabs whether you're an nlu graduate or you've gone from another law school or you've passed law from under the tree so there's no restriction per se but i would say that nalsar gives you the environment to go and grab things at a younger age when compared to other law schools certainly um so this especially this segment of you know the conversation has truly been very very um engrossing and it's it's pretty impactful for me as well as an aspirant who is you know taking into consideration a lot of things right now um so i think as someone who would want to know or have any clarifications i feel like we've exhausted any question that i might have or anybody else in my position would um so if i could expect like a very concise concluding statement from both of you summarizing what you felt about the entire conversation quickly and then we could wrap this up yeah let's let's shrey you can take over first so sure, so so i think the easiest way to wrap this up is enjoy the experience no matter which law school you are in because it's the experience that matters the connections that you make the networking you do because uh, probably after two after about four months collectively on campus and about six months online i've made i've made friends and i've made connections for a lifetime people who i can approach even in the middle of the night and ask them questions because when i was doing my internship recently i still kept annoying my seniors asking them questions about say contracts can the so and so contract be executed can so and so contract be filed for a breach even though it hasn't been even though it hasn't come into force so a law school is there is education is one side the other side of it is experiencing real life these things again uh, nlus do give you that tag that you're an nlu graduate and it does help you when it comes to your job opportunities but at the end of the day don't become complacent because of it just say because i'm an alsar graduate i can do whatever i want but take whatever experiences you get whether it's moot courts adrs debates do whatever you can do as much as of as much as of it you can another thing is law college is never restrict you so if you have things such as hobbies like playing music dancing doing theater law school will be more than happy to help uh, cultivate that uh, hobby of yours and make it into something exponentially big you find people who you can relate to more than you have in your whole life so i play basketball uh, i found seniors of mine friends of mine who i can play basketball with at any time of the day whether it's 6 in the morning or 2 in the night all of us just come gather around we play basketball we have a cup of tea and it's an experience in itself that's something you have to learn to do that's something you have to learn to network and i think i'll just end it with one last thing is that do as many internships as you can because internships are where you actually learn how the law actually functions and i think i i would end by saying all the best for your results good luck with whatever happens but don't if you don't make it through clat and ilet it's not the end of the world there's a whole world outside of these uh, outside of these nlu bubbles which has been created not just by our parents but by society these training institutes is just a tiny bubble there's a big world outside of this bubble that exists so with that i would like to conclude and thank you so much for me for being such a great moderator my pleasure shreya naman sir if you could hear it from you i think shreya has uh, covered uh, almost uh, 99% of everything that uh, i intended to say but it's so glad that it's coming from him because him being a nalsa student he has also understood the uh, world outside the compounds of the four walls of nalsa campus oh uh, well uh, once again uh, re summarizing or reiterating what uh, the gentleman just said uh, once again uh, take anybody any legal stalwart as an example 
the living uh, lawyer, law legends, or anybody of your choice, the Supreme Court judges, etc. These are the people who have studied in the most deplorable conditions, uh, in the most pathetic conditions, and you know have gone up to the top ranks. Uh, be it the sitting chief justice of India, uh, N.V. Ramana. He was not even a dedicated lawyer. I think I was reading somewhere that his law was also a correspondent graduation and not a proper law school because he was more inclined towards journalism and he was doing journalism for three years of his life. Uh, so this way, people who have gone on to achieve uh, in the field or even outside the field are people you know who, are, who did not have the tag. I'm not saying people with the tag have not done it. Even they have done wonders. But... This is just a facilitating process, but at the larger outset, it's all about how you visualize your life, how you give yourself to that entire process, how you plan uh, your entire career and how you go with the flow. When you plan, you know, don't be rigid about it. Be flexible, be, and it, the next five years that you're giving yourself uh, into this profession, go with an open mind. Open mind so to learn, open mind to network, open mind to grow, open mind to experiment and explore. Because at the end of the day, what is destined for you? Of course, you craft, uh, you make your own destiny. It's not that you know, like this is something in store for you. But there is some power which will always navigate and instinctively make you take certain decisions, and that it will lead you to where you have uh, paved your own path. So. Uh, be open to all kinds of opportunities always never give up you know always when you when life gives you an easy comfortable option and a hard option choose that option which puts you out of the comfort zone give yourself to hardships give yourself to pain and at the same time try to convert you are going through these hardships and pain of course it won't be a pleasurable experience but converting adversaries into advantage is where you know success lies because success at the end of the day sides only with the brave. So even if you do not get into your dream law school, I know while preparing, you would have put, I've seen so many aspirants who take a printout of NLSIU, stick it on their study board, and every day morning they wake up to that and they're like, I get into that law school and suddenly an undesirable result happens. They're like, oh, I'll take a break here, but do not waste time. Because at your age or even no matter how serious you are about studying for CLAT, you know, once you take a break here, you will be giving yourself to a lot of distractions. And even if you say, no, I'll shut social media, I'll only stay grounded to books, you're missing out a lot on life. You're missing out on traveling. You're missing out on making new friends. You're missing out on a lot of opportunities that you could have built. You know, in this one year, maybe you could have just joined a random law school built upon entrepreneurial thoughts. Now, Shreya, for that example, said that, you know, NLSIU has the best law school, best moot court system. Maybe uh, you can join a law school which does not even have a moot court society, but you take the lead, you take the initiative, you take the effort and start your own moot court society. Go start your own MUN society. University Law College, as, a hist as I already told you, has a historic uh, moot court society with a lot of alumni support. MUN was something new to the college. Today, when I go back, I have the satisfaction that, you know, I have... When I left the college, it did not have a MUN club. Today, we have a debating society which predominantly works in MUN and youth parliament. Ten years down the line of University Law College, they may not remember who Naman Mankudari is, but I am satisfied because I have left something for the institution that has given me so much. I have done something for the institution where students can participate and outgrow themselves and you know, like get the best exposure that Model United Nations or youth parliament can potentially provide to them. So leave behind a legacy in every institution you go to national law school of course good you know like you know as shay said it may give you a red carpet opportunities to uh, various avenues but if you go into institutions some may complain that you know what oh this school does not even have a proper debating society they don't have a proper literature club they don't have a proper theater club they don't have a proper dance club why don't you take it up you start for the institution people may criticize you you may not get uh, great faculty or the management support but fighting those odds, signing representations, taking the initiative, starting on your own. And when you see something uh, which has been your brainchild take shape, that satisfaction cannot be measured through words. You know, when you start your own legacy, when you start your own society, when you start your own association, when what you're doing is influencing many others, the satisfaction you get is immeasurable. The legacy you leave behind is gratifying. So that way, stay connected to the field, stay connected to the fraternity, come out of your comfort zone. You may say that, sir, I'm an introvert. I don't know how to go to the court. I don't understand the language. Go there. 
make that effort understand what is notary understand how to read the cases when it is shown on the case list understand how the virtual courts work interact with the peons of the court interact with the registrars of the court interact with the secretaries to the judges interact in with other uh, fellow advocates other interns because just by reading and arguing you don't learn anything because the entire process is in how to file a case in the court how to negotiate with the court clerk and see to that your matter gets listed uh, immediately in the next 24 hours how to get you know how to negotiate with the people and see to that uh, you uh, your deal is has the upper hand when you're dealing with mediation and arbitration cases what is that you can do that you know the your other your counterparts have not done to make sure that your case is presented in a unique way so there is tremendous scope for growth there is tremendous scope for development which institutions don't tell you it's all about uh, how you as an individual change from within so be the change leave you know make sure that you leave behind a legacy stay dedicated to your career do not give yourself to a lot of distractions but at the same time make sure that you do not discount on fun travel as much as you can explore meet new people learn as much as you can read as many books as you can as shrey said try to cultivate new hobbies like classical music dance theater sports anything that you want to some of them told me that sir for clat i was a very good cricketer so but because of a uh, clat i had to stop my cricket because of clat i had to stop my theater get the urvi yourself because of clat you compromised a lot on your dancing now if you have already done it get back rejuvenate reorganize and reestablish and at the same time balance it out with your education because now is the time to stay focused now is this time to you know uh, use our time very judiciously and now is the time to create tremendous changes in this country or across the globe because youth is the new potential because today we are living in the startup culture back in the days it was all on seniority even to this day judges promotion advocates promotion all this is based on seniority but 10 years down the line it will be the youth because you look at the because in this entrepreneurial and startup culture people in their late 30s or early 30s are becoming billionaires people who are in their uh, early 40s are the richest people on the globe people uh, you know who are uh, young uh, and dynamic are the ones filing petitions in the supreme court uh, so like for example advocates like jay saidi paksar who truly inspire an entire generation you know he must be hardly in his 30s or 40s but look at the impact he has on the youth so use uh, the energy very potentially and i think we can do uh, tremendous in that so law school is just a platform but if you are a good dancer stage really never matters you can dance on the road and still get the name music you don't need a robust studio you can just sing on uh, you can just sing on the street and make name so law school is just like a platform while your talent is what should be in the spotlight so with this i'd like to thank urvi uh, for such a, a robust moderation and shrey for such a wise and a very uh, well conceptualized uh, uh, points of view uh, and thank you very much uh, to the two of you for making this session very fruitful and helpful i hope a lot of them have a lot of benefit from this with this i rest my case thank you uh thank you so much navan sir and thank you shreyank uh, as well for joining us today and you know really providing such an insightful and not just insightful but also an interesting take on um, you know what a law aspirant might want to hear especially since you guys have recently been in school in the experience and are experiencing the immediate world after that it's extremely for everyone watching this um that it thank you gentlemen wonderful conversation and i hope all of you have a really good day thank you